So welcome everybody to my presentation about Scala Macros. I wanted to make title of this presentation very catchy, although I'm aware that there is no silver bullet in software engineering, but Scala Macros, or maybe speaking more generally, metaprogramming has very wide range of use cases. Uh, very, of very often, even in this conference, you will hear don't use macros, don't use macros, it's some, some kind of magic. And, and this is true, it's some kind of magic, but I, will, I want to give you some use cases where they are useful. Uh, <clears throat> so for me personally, uh, it was very enjoyable to learn them and to use them to solve everyday problems. So let's start. And a few words, a few words about me. I'm Bartosz Bombol. I work in a company called Javeo. Uh, Javeo is located in Warsaw. We do applications mostly in Java and Scala using, you might call it, reactive technology stack. And by the way, I have included here my Twitter, nick Twitter nickname and link to my blog. And uh, on my blog, I have written three blog posts about this uh, topic of macros. So if you will find this topic interesting, I encourage you to preview them. Uh, what else? So to sum up, this is about me page. I'm just a regular developer who tried to use this language experimental feature, and today I want to share with you from, with my experiences from this experiment. So let's get started. So what about some traditional survey, and let me ask some questions. Uh, how many of you have heard about Scala Macros? Yes, that's almost everybody. And how many of you have used Scala Macros or in project? Okay, so a few people. So that was expecting, otherwise you would not be here. And, but to the point, uh, this is the screenshot from the documentation, which by the way is very good and extensive with a lot of theory and use cases, but you will find this sign experimental. Yeah? So it means that it is still an experimental feature of the language, uh, but it is also widely used by developers features. So we'll see some examples, a couple of slides later, how you could use macros. And today we'll try to grasp the essence of macros. I want to present them in, in kind of nutshell, yeah? So let's start with some simple theory. So according to the fantastic presentations by one of Scala Macros creators, Eugene Burmako, macros are good for, for, uh, good for three things, yeah? Code generation, static checks, and domain-specific languages. And by the way, I encourage you to preview this presentation after my talk. Mm. I have included link to, to it at final uh, slide of my presentation. So now we've got some idea, general idea, uh, what they are good for. Let's go a little bit deeper. So I have included here some bullet points, some key features of macros, yeah, just to preview them right now. And uh, macros allow metaprogramming in Scala. Yeah? So metaprogramming is generating new or modifying existing code. And for me, metaprogramming, generating or modifying existing code is because you want to drive this car. It's kind of cool, it's nice looking, good looking, and it's, what is more important, it is easy to drive, yeah? But you want to drive this car, which has feature, features of this machine. It's very complex, it's very powerful, it can do a lot of stuff, but it's hard to drive, yeah? So, <clears throat> and what else? You want to have this transformation at compile time, of course. So, uh, these are, this is a very important feature of Scala macros, they are expanded at compile time. Uh, macros manipulate AST, whatever this AST is. You've got some API to build this AST, and so on. So, macros are great, macros are great for building libraries, and maybe this is why they are so widely used there. And they are written in Scala, so you can use your favorite language to write them, or, or my favorite language to write them. So, um, now we'll focus on the first point, and we'll try to understand what metaprogramming is. And this is how I imagine macros. You've got some simple useful thing which somewhere under the hood at compile time changes to some powerful gigantic robot, yeah? So, uh, so macros can transform your code from this beetle to, to, to some kind of machine, yeah? So, and you might like to think of metaprogramming as some kind of magic because what it does is a short of magic, a little short of magic, and what do I mean by that? But being almost serious, maybe you've watched the Leonardo DiCaprio movie Inception, uh, yes? 
Yeah, so uh, the movie is about dreaming inside some other dream. Yeah, this is kind of story where people could get inside somebody's other's dream and do something inside it, modify it a little bit. I know it's kind of abstract for those who didn't watch it, but this idea of dreaming inside some other dream is kind of similar to metaprogramming, which is programming inside some other program. Yeah, so metaprogram is a program which takes as an input other program, modifies it a little bit, changes its behavior and returns it. <coughs> so is metaprogramming specific to Scala? Is it a new concept? And of course not. Metaprogramming exists in many known languages. Uh, I have outlined here you know, the very popular languages which has metaprogramming. And it is considered as a very controversial feature. And because you know, with a lot of power comes great responsibility and macros or metaprogramming gives the developer a lot of power. And what do I mean by that? So. Let's focus on macro example in C. These are very simple examples. And what C preprocessor does in this case, it mm, replaces code snippet with our macro body at, before compilation. So the compiled code will look quite different than this written by developer. I have also included here a conditional compilation. So proper code will be compiled only if some kind of uh, condition will succeed, yeah? So uh, it could be useful when you are writing some kind of mobile uh, library for mobile devices, and iOS and Android has, have different uh, code review requirements, so we might choose which code might compile depending on platform, yeah? So it, it looks kind of cool, but uh, there, are, there are some downsides, and look at this beast. And if you haven't seen those, this example before, what it does, it replaces true to false in your code, yeah? So if you're a funny developer, it might, it might be very tempting to write something like this, yeah? But the consequences might not be so good for you. And, but this is valid and possible to do, and this is possible answer to the question why metaprogramming is so controversial, because you can do a lot of stuff there. Uh, and, but I wanted to highlight the weakness of C macro here. So we are back to Scala. Yeah? So which libraries use macros? So I have outlined here some Scala superstars which were somewhere under the hood, uh, use macros to accomplish their goals. And we'll focus a little bit more on Play Framework uh, just to show you a real example of power of macros. So the first example is parsing JSON. Yeah? You've got uh, case class and you want to parse it to the JSON because you are building some REST API. It's a very common situation, right? So uh, you've got a lot of these transformations in your code. And how to do this in Play Framework? And this is how you can achieve it in Play Framework. You've got this uh, method write. You specify which fields this JSON should have. And, and, it's possible, and it's possible to do it in this way. But I want to highlight here a typical first word problem, boilerplate code. Yeah? So let's think about code on the left, so this case class, uh, car, as a set of words, a bag of tokens, whatever. Yeah? It's a set of bag of tokens, set of words. If we could take those words, if we could take this owner, string, int, year, yeah? these words, rearrange them a little bit. Uh, modify, uh, modify them, uh, add some new syntax, then we could achieve code on the right. And this is the main idea. And of course, this is not my idea. Somebody else had exactly the same, this idea before, and try to implement this. And this is the result. So this is how in Play Framework you can uh, achieve sim the same uh, goal, the same thing. So this is how you can convert uh, object to JSON. And it is more concise, the redundant code, uh, code lines are removed, so it's easier to read and so on. It's more compact, yeah? So let's check how this method is implemented. And let's look at file JSON Scala at this writes method definition, and there is a comment above it which says exactly what this method does. And we see that this comment is saying that the line highlighted on red is transformed to the to these lines, em <laughs> enormous amount of boilerplate highlighted on blue, and <clears throat> which we want to avoid writing, yeah? So now let's focus on implementation, and implementation also looks very concise if we only knew what this macro keyword means, yeah? So first, start, start with some simple examples. Um, okay. So look at the simple method invocation. It will not do anything magical, just print line some text. But look closely at this. Do you see something suspicious here? Do you see something uh, uh, 
I don't know, weird? So? Okay, never mind. Uh, the, the developer from outside cannot specify <laughs> if method is implemented using Scala macros or not. So this method is uh, valid. <laughs> it's nothing suspicious here. But, but let's look at the implementation of this hello method. So this is object welcome. And what is important, it should be specified in different compilation phase, so different uh, SBT project, which your project should depend on. But this is some kind of configurational detail. You can um, uh, check it on my blog post, how to do this. It's not the case for now. So uh, signature of dev hello looks pretty standard, except this macro keyword. And this macro keyword is the way how you select implementation of your macro. So now let's see the, how the implementation looks like. And hello implementation takes two sets of arguments. Uh, first one is context. Yeah, it's type context, and second one is tree. Retur returning type is also this mysterious tree. Uh, so let's look at imported packages, for example. So uh, look at import uh, package, and you can see that there is a black box word, yeah, the black box package, and macros in Scala come in two flavors, black box and white box. If macro faithfully follow their type definition, they, their type signature, then it, it might be considered, the, considered as black box, so it is black box. And if type signature of macro is only some kind of abbreviation, then macro is white box. Yeah? And it's more confident to use macro black box when you're writing def macro, so uh, this example. So documentation says that. So now let's look at implementation. And I have said a couple of slides before that metaprogram is a program which takes as an input other program, transforms it a little bit, and returns a new program. And this method, this hello implementation method, uh, you might think about this name parameter as piece of your code, yeah? Piece of your code. So this is the metaprogram which takes as an input other program and returns other program. It's not specifically program, but we'll go further with the definition. So, uh, mm, let's start with some theory, yeah? Let's repeat what macros are. So macros are functions that are called by the compiler during compilation. And within these functions, the programmer has access to the compiler API, so he can type check code, he can generate code, analyze it, and so on. And uh, to do this, we need some API. And context wraps a compiler universe and provides you an API for... Uh, metaprogramming. And this universe package is refinement over universe known from reflection, Scala reflection package. So you might think about it as, meta, as API for metaprogramming. And second parameter is tree, and this is the type which re represents abstract syntax tree. So in macros implementation, we'll operate, we'll produce a kind of low-level structure like abstract syntax tree. Mm. We can ad arbitrarily modify those trees, and then compiler will check a result of our modification. So we'll see later advantages of it. And the last thing of our macro is returning type. Yeah? So as you see, the type is also tree. So let's look at the body. And uh, this is body of uh, our implementation. And as you suppose, current year is a value which holds current year as an integer. And uh, but what is this Q interpolator? It's more uh, interesting, yeah? So it's called quasi-quotes, and this is how you can build uh, AST, abstract syntax tree in Scala. This is an API for building AST. So you can build your code with ease using kind of human readable code and using this construction called quasi-quotes. So let, let's look closer to the last line of this macro. And this line is pretty important. You can use Q interpolator to build AST. Yeah? It looks similar to building a string, so the syntax of, in, of this interpolator is commonly used in other Scala interpolators. But what is this AST? What is abstract syntax tree? So AST is core data structure using in compilers. So let's say that we have following piece of code, 1 plus 12, 2 plus 3. Yeah? So early stage of compilation is lexical analysis. And what it does is checking the sequence of code elements and it assigns them to tokens. So uh, this is an example how this code might look like after lexical analysis. And each sign is assigned to some token, but there are also redundant signs, like parentheses, for example. And compiler needs simpler data structure, for example, without parentheses. And this is an example of AST. So we've got tokens and operations, right? So for compiler, 
this tree is an information how code is structured and how to evaluate it. I have included two versions of graphical AST representation just to give you a bigger perspective what it is. So let's say that you have created some language with an API for building AST, and plus is just some representation of code token. So AST written in your language uh, could be created in similar way. So, and it will result, result with following structure. Yeah? It, it, it might look like this. So why have I, why I have written this AST example in this way? Yeah? So let's go back to our example. And this code also builds AST. QA interpolator allows you to build AST easier, as I said before. So if they allow you to build AST easier, there, sh there should be also some kind of harder way. Yeah? And what does this expression produce? And this is generated tree. You can generate it using a show row method in, in, this, uh, in Scala. So it looks a bit more complicated uh, than the previ previous example. Uh, each of these objects are subtypes of type tree. Mm, and this is why I have written this AST example, 1 plus 2 plus 3, in, in this way, just to show you the different notations you might use. So let's compare those two ways of creating AST. And this slide is pretty important because I want to highlight what quasi-quotes gives you. So without, without quasi-quotes, you might uh, build your tree in this way, and this is absolutely valid. It is, you might put the equality sign between code on the left and code on the right. Uh, so I want to show you how they simplify creating AST. You can write human readable code, and somewhere under the hood it replaces to, uh, to, to, to this uh, tree built from tokens. Can I have a question? Yeah. Does it type check? I mean, does it check for correctness of the screen? Here, no. Uh, on, the, on the left, if I, if I mistake. No, no, no. It's only building AST. Then it is passed further to the compiler. And compiler will say, oh, okay, you, messed some, you did some syntax error, for example, yeah? So uh, your question is, macro is different project, yeah? It is, uh, it's, you know, it is only for building AST. Then if you are using it in your project, then your compiler from your project will check the syntax from mm, build it AST. <laughs> so, mm, what else? So quasi quotes also come in many flavors. You've got different uh, interpolators for building different structures. And uh, if you would like to build, for example, body of the case clause, uh, then you will use CQ interpolator. Yeah? If you want to build for loop enumerator, then use FQ, in FQ. If you want to build some type, then TQ. And you will find more examples on block and on uh, documentation. I just want to say that they are uh, existing. Yeah? So now, uh, let's look at a little bit more practical example. That, that was some introduction to the topic. And so let's consider the following situation. Yeah? We want to have possibility to easily benchmark methods. So uh, we would like to know how much time the method takes to execute. How to do this? This is how you can achieve it. And it just wraps your code in timestamps between timestamps and print line the result of difference between those timestamps. So nothing fancy. And actually, nothing important, yeah? But let's look closer at this wrapper. So this is boilerplate, and we would like to avoid writing this. Oh, come on. So we are wrapping body of our method with some timestamps, but this is not important to understand the behavior of our method, yeah? And it would be tedious to write this each time you want to check the time, right? The time difference. So this. Also, the best option would be to not touch the method body at all. So how to do this? And this is the example how you can achieve similar behavior, behavior using Scala macro annotations. And this is different type of macro, which allows you to write annotations, which can change annotating definition at compile time. Yeah? It's important. So uh, personally, it's my favorite type of macro. Mm, what is cool, in my opinion here, uh, we don't have to touch existing code. We are just outside the method, we are just annotating it, and we don't have to modify method body at all. I mean, developer don't have to uh, uh, modify it. So, uh, so this benchmark annotation in some, some magical way transforms our method to uh, achieve our goal, yeah? So let's look 
what we want to achieve. So on the left, we've got desirable syntax, and on the right, we've got what this syntax should be equivalent. So uh, we want to produce this code, but we want to write this code. We want to drive this cool mini Cooper, and we want to expand it to this gigantic amount of <laughs> boilerplate. So how to achieve this using Scala macro annotations? Uh, this is the definition of our macro, and what is important class benchmark, so definition of our annotation, is extending static annotation trait, which specifies how uh, implementation of macro annotation should look like. And method macro transform take parameters which are called annotees, and so there are elements which we are annotating, so methods or classes or values, whatever, whatever we are annotating. And next, next we've got macro keyword and following implementation of macro. So let's focus on it. And this is how uh, our macro implementation looks like. And let's focus on specific parts of it. So there are differences between uh, dev macros and macro annotations when looking at their implementations. One difference is we need to implement macro transform method. So from the previous slide. And next difference is our implementation takes two sets of arguments. First one is context. We know what context is. It's an API for metaprogramming. And what these annotees are, these are expression of n. And uh, what, how you can think about this expression, it, it is just some kind of wrapper around AST. So mm -hmm. uh, now let's look at this body of this implementation. So what is going on here? So annotees is a sequence of annotated definitions, as we said earlier, and we want to have them in form of AST. So we are mapping this uh, collection and transforming each element to tree. And next outstanding, in my opinion, feature uh, of um, uh, quasi-quotes is this extractor pattern. So you see this case. Uh, you, you see pattern matching when on the case clause you've got uh, this pattern and this pattern is copied from the documentation. You will have different patterns for different annotees. So if you want to annotate, uh, annotate uh, class, you will have quite a little bit different pattern. Uh, but what is important, you can extract what is important, what, what is impor important for, from your annotation. Yeah? So you can extract method name, types, arguments, returning type, and so on. Uh, let's focus a little bit more on this case clause and look at this weird two dots and three dots sign. Yeah, for, for me, that was quite weird when I saw, the, saw them first time. So what do they mean? And these are patterns, of course. Two dots means that in this place you expect list of three, and three dots mean that you are expecting list of list of three. And why is that? So the reason is, be the reason is because method can take one set of arguments uh, one set of type parameters, so list of three, yeah? And method can, takes, uh, can take many um, sets of arguments, so list of list of three, yeah? And this is the pattern, um, so now maybe it's the good moment to imagine how you would pattern match code if you have to generate it from string, for example. So, um, so I hope you see what this API uh, gives you. So, back to our implementation. This is core of our implementation. This is the real body. And we are here generating new AST. So, in this example, we return the same method with the same signature with a change a little bit body. So, we are assigning body to some value result. We are returning this value. And we are wrapping the code with start and end values, yes? And we are print lining the difference between uh, end and start. So actually, we are doing what we want, yes? So we, at compile time, somewhere under the hood, we are building, we are modifying our code to accomplish this uh, benchmark thing. Uh, so look at this first line, and we are building here a method with the same signature, but there is a good place to mess up a little bit, and we can change it. So for example, your question was about uh, changing um, Checking for correctness, yeah? So let's say that you will change return type, for example. This is the, re the same return type your method has, but let's change it to, I don't know, string. So what will happen? Our method is returning uh, integer because it's powering some number, yeah, whatever. And you will have to statically write here string. So of course you will have compile time error that uh, your method is, you know, uh, returning something wrong. This result will be, the, will be integer and return type will be string. So more examples and code to them. 
uh, you can find in my blog mm, and mentioned earlier posts. So these were some kind of small examples just to fit you in the context mm, of this meta programming thing. And what you should be aware now is mm, Scala macros are about building code from uh, three types and using this kind of cool API and replacing all the AST with new modified one. And everything is at compile time, what is important. So now let's look at the use case we had in, our in one of our recent projects. So we have written a small library, which we called Grizzly. Yeah? The Grid and uh, Grizzly, dangerous bear, because macros are so dangerous and powerful. But why Grid? Uh, what was our main problem? So on this slide, you can see typical front-end table. So you've got a lot of columns, you've got a lot of data, you want to have uh, option to uh, filter those columns, you've got, you've got here uh, dynamic pagination, right? You've got option to sort those columns and so on. And we want to do this pagination filtering and sorting on the back end because we've got a lot of data. Uh, so project was written in Play Framework, which is actually not so important, and Slick, which is more important, and AngularJS, which is absolutely not important in this case. So uh, working example from this uh, slide, from this GIF, you will find on Java's GitHub. So I encourage you to preview it. So let's dig deeper into this problem. And Slick is functional relational relational mapping for Scala. And what it does in two words, it just replaces Scala syntax uh, to SQL. And this is the example. So this is a small example of what Slick does. It just replaces uh, Scala syntax to SQL. And of course, Slick has its own API for sorting, for filtering, paginating. Yeah? So let's look at the example how we could uh, implement this whole sorting, filtering um, in Slick for our purposes. So let's say that we've got users table. This is representation of users table in Slick. Uh, don't get into syntax too much, it's not important. What is important, you've got some columns, yeah, first name, last name, gender, notes. And this, this is SQL table, yeah? So let's preview necessary methods. I said earlier that you, in Slick you've got an API for building salting, filtering, pagination. So uh, these are methods which allows us to build desired uh, behavior, and of course, uh, when you filter the table, it transforms to select with where clause without uh, surprises. Uh, you can also paginate, uh, paginate your data using drop and take methods, and of course, you can sort by selected column, ascending, descending, and it will translate to sele select query with order by ascending, descending. Yeah? So this is what we need to build sorting in slick, sorting, filtering, and paginating. So now let's use those methods to create full pagination needed for our, for our example. So there is a lot of code, but there is nothing special here. Don't focus too much on the syntax. What we are doing here, so for different uh, parameters from front end table, we are building slightly different uh, sort by. So for first name ascending, we'll build sort by first name ascending, and so on. So what is repeated here? So what tokens from this code exists in each line, and it would be great if they would be generated. So what I want to highlight right now is this boilerplate code. So look at this code in terms of tokens as we look at this code from JSON example. So for each column of our users table, we have to write almost the same code. Mm. What differs is case parameter. This tuple of strings with column name and sorting direction, and of course sort by function body differs a little bit. Uh, so actually what we can treat as boilerplate is also this ascending, descending uh, words, yeah? because we always want to have uh, sorting in two directions. We always want to have sorting in ascending way and descending. So it is tedious to write this by developer. And so if we remove ascending and descending from our code, then we have got each column name token repeated, so we can get rid of the repetitions. And our code is a little bit simplified. So do we fi finish now? Can we do better? And Leo says that it is still too much boilerplate. And by the way, this photo, ma'am, is from Movie Inception, which I have mentioned at the beginning of our philosophical discussion about metaprogramming. And actually, from this perspective, what is important to build this whole sort by 
is uh, column names. Yeah? So uh, this is the one element which differs in each line. So you remember the example of parsing JSON? And it is a similar case. Mm. If you have only those tokens uh, with column names, it is possible to generate rest of the code. Or to be more specific, to be more specific, build bigger AST <laughs> with something. OK, so uh, now we have to filter our data by columns. And don't get into the slick syntax too much. What is important here, that still we've got a lot of boilerplate code. What tokens are needed to build this code? And more or less, those ones. And similarly to sorting, if we would have column names, we could generate the rest of the boilerplate code. So now is the fun part, requiring your imagination. How to design your library, or how to design your macro, yeah? to grab all the required tokens, do some kind of magic inside your macro, and achieve your goal. Yeah? So. Uh, my idea is, is this. So this is how you can achieve all the required tokens from user to generate the sort by filtering, paginating thing. And uh, this is how I try to reduce boilerplate. So for comparison, I, I wanted to uh, compare uh, th this uh, syntax of macro with generated code, what it generates. And generated code looks like this. I wanted to fit it on the slide, but actually it couldn't fit. So imagine that it and somewhere here, probably. Yeah, so it's what I want to highlight on the left is less, on the right is more. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so full generated code you can preview on Java's GitHub. And let's look at this syntax again. So, what developer has to specify is set of columns, yeah, and optional filter like so. For example, if you want to filter by, by comparing equality then you will write, write equals. If you want to filter by like, then you, then you can write like or leave it blank. So <clears throat> it's the, the library internals or syntax is not important in this example, but uh, I wanted to highlight some language feature which helps us reducing redundant code. So you might argue that this syntax is fully free from boilerplate, because a couple of slides before I have said that all you need is uh, column names. And here you've got some types, here you've got some strings, here you've got some method functions. And why is that? And one reason is visibility and IDE support. I thought that it would be easier f to parameterize this grid column object with some types, and it would be hint for the developer which this, uh, how this method, uh, the second parameter should look like. And I didn't want to say about the syntax. You can find details on Java or GitHub, but mm, what you can remember from this example is this class users grid is only some bag, some container for tokens. Yeah. So developer who wants to use this library has to provide me proper words, proper tokens. Then Grizzly will take them, rearrange them a little bit, add some syntax, modify those tokens, and build bigger AST with desired syntax. So. But what I wanted to highlight here is other problem problem with macros, and this is problem. This problem is IDE support. So let's stay with Grizzly example. Uh, so this is code from our project, and <laughs> it looks quite suspicious. Everything is highlighted in red. But it compiles, and it works properly. So let's look at the search result. And you are invoking method grid, uh, me method run on this object. And maybe, as you remember, there is no method run in this class. So it should be, it probably it is generated by macro. And it is magical and kind of fun to write, but it would be a pain to use this kind of library without, in best case, documentation or without some IDE support. And as you presume, there is a solution for this problem. And personally, I'm using IntelliJ IDEA at my everyday work. And when I have started to play with macros, I was a little bit disappointed because, for example, if macro annotation adds new method to the uh, annotated uh, definition, so as it is in our example of grid, uh, then uh, IntelliJ IDEA cannot see it because its coding assistance is based on static code analysis and it is not aware of AST changes. So it's a kind of problem. But in October last year, IntelliJ IDEA published this post and there it was explained that uh, IntelliJ is providing small API for building plugins uh, to support, support macros. So, Actually, writing your IDEA plugin is not that hard. And in third post about macros in my blog, you will find small example how to do this. So 
uh, it requires a little more effort to make your macro fully, uh, how to say, fully complete. Yeah? But still, I think that in some cases it might be worth it. If you have a couple of week weekends free. And what about debugging? I, want to s I, I hope that I will run off time right now. <laughs> I wanted to skip this slide. <laughs> so debugging of macros is quite complicated because what you are actually doing is two things. First of all, you are generating the tree, which should accomplish some logic. And second of all, it should perform some perform this logic. Yeah? So you have to first uh, build this tree and check, OK, so I built it and it works. But, but then you have to check if it, if it works correctly. So testing and debugging should be, uh, how to say it, two-phase process. Yeah? So you should debug on real body, this, the, the, your macro. So I, th I think that it would be the best if you would uh, preview the examples and play with them just to show you, just to see how it is to write and debug your macro. So we are going to the end. And what I wanted to give you today is uh, give you the taster of Scala macros. I use them to hide complex logic inside simpler syntax. And the reason to do this is to reduce places where you can make mistakes. So the less code developer has to write, uh, the fewer errors he will make. And also the solution simplifies debugging. And 45 minutes is not enough to present you sh all the features of uh, macros and quasi quotes API. <laughs> but as I said earlier, you will find examples uh, in uh, in my blog in my blog and also in uh, Scala macros page. There is some kind of uh, bookmark with talks where you will find all the papers and interesting talks. And I have also included here the link to the presentation from company called underscore io. I think this very good presentation, so I encourage you to preview it. And what else? I hope that I convinced you a little bit that macros are not so scary, and they could be useful to avoid writing boilerplate code. And so the code of Grizzly is on Java's GitHub. Mm, I hope that using macros in your projects will result with fa in faster development, more concise code, and more than a little fun as you master Scala macros, as it was in my case. So thank you very much for listening. Any questions? We have, uh, we are debugging code and <laughs> using our ID now. Mm -hmm. Let's let it be idea and um, is it uh, this code? Because you know, uh, macro generates a AST, mm -hmm. and uh, during debugging, I would like to see some source code. Uh, is it uh, readable in any way? Because yes, uh, y y I mean, you, you want to see the generated code and not the AST, right? Uh, yes, because generating uh, code from AST is not one to one function, you can uh, it's almost one to one. The sugaring, for example, of, uh, yes, for comprehension and other things, and uh, yes, 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 the, the and the also names uh, inside macros. I, I don't know. Maybe that's under my control. But uh, I was just curious if it is not uh, too much pain to debug uh, this code generated by macro. I would say that it's a little more pain than the normal code to debug, because. What, what I was doing in my uh, example of this Grizzly, I was generating the code uh, with this uh, short code method. Yeah, I was generating it. Then I was copy, uh, copying it to my project, replacing the macro invocation, and I, then I was checking the resulting uh, behavior. Yeah, so I was kind of reverse engineering. Then I re repair what I have to repair. Yeah, and there, there I move it to my macro. I change what I have to change. And this is how I debugged it. So it's kind of, I don't know how to call it, reverse engineering, I don't know. Yeah. So maybe it's kind of primitive, maybe there are better ways, so, but it worked for me. Can you do self-typing in uh, macros? Uh, yes, uh, and uh, there is, uh, about, about your question, there is in this Scala macros uh, first link, 
there is a repository from Eugene Burmako where he shows uh, examples how to do this uh, on GitHub on examples. So if you want to preview the details, I encourage you. There is uh, Scala Macros 101, I think, something. The, the repository is called like, like this. Uh, can you comment, please, on why uh, Sleek ceased using uh, macros, even though they are so awesome? Like, they used to have experimental support for defining the tables, which is pretty much boilerplate code, mm -hmm. and then they uh, deprecated it in 3.0, and then eventually ceased them completely in 3.1. Why? Uh, I don't know exactly why. I read in the documentation the explanation why they did this, and they said that it was too error-prone to define a table, uh, and also the migrations, I think also, also they uh, was, uh, you could write migrations also in Scala. So they said that it is too error prone and it was too buggy to use it. Bec but we have been using this uh, generating SQL, uh, for example, this user's definition in Slick two, version two, but uh, now we are not using it because you know <laughs> they said that it is too buggy. And can we nest macros? Can we nest macros, like we have some code, apply a macro to it to transform to yeah, another course. code and yes, then use another macro? Yes, to, of course. To macro is just a you know, project which you can nest. And uh, in this example, uh, uh, this macro is, um, your project is dependent on this macro project, but you can you know, build a bigger chain. OK, uh, we, are, uh, we already run out out of time, so please thank our speaker once again. Thank you very much.